Okay, so let's uh, pray together. Would you bow your heart with me, please? Father, we are so thankful to you for your incredible love for us. Teach us how to be able to serve you in a more excellent way. Minister to our hearts in a way that can help us grow to become even greater disciples of Jesus. In fact, we ask you this in his wonderful name. Amen. Today I want to begin a brand new three-part teaching series that I title Building Emotionally Healthy Relationships. So if you have your Bibles, join me in Luke chapter 10. We're going to camp out there today. One of the things I've been learning is that successful living must include healthy relationships. You can be successful in business, you can be successful in finance, you can be successful with educational goals and accomplishments, and even in sports and music. But if you're a failure in building emotionally healthy, healthy relationships, you're really dabbling with failure. What I've learned also is that to have emotionally healthy relationships, it begins by me having and placing a high value on relationships. Jesus had a lot to say about this. So let's look at Luke 10 and verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You're worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Stop there. Although the setting for this Bible lesson is in the home, don't limit, because I won't limit, my teaching to just a familial relationship, be it husband and wife, parents and children, siblings. No. Building emotionally healthy relationships must take place in the workplace, in school, in the broader community, in all aspects of your professional life, including your church life. Every area where you interact with others, the goal should always, should always be, I need to build emotionally healthy relationships. So for these next few moments, let's go now to the home of Martha and Mary. Middle Eastern society in the first century was very much communal in style. At times you'll see three generations living under the same roof, grandparents, parents, and children. In this particular case, we find two adult sisters living together, Martha and Mary. And their home was in the village of Bethany. Bethany, by the way, was just two miles from Jerusalem. And their home was apparently close to the main road from Jerusalem to you know, the Transjordan. And so Jesus was either going to Jerusalem or coming from Jerusalem. The Bible is silent as to which particular route he was taking, going or coming. But one thing we do know, he stopped over at the home of Mary and Martha. And it was unexpected. He just popped in. And when he popped in, Mary and Martha started scurrying about preparing the home and perhaps a meal for Jesus and his disciples. Well, at some point, Mary just left Martha and she went and sat down at the feet of Jesus and just listening. Martha became livid. Can you imagine? She said, look at Mary. All kinds of thoughts entering Martha's mind. And she sat there. It bothered Martha so much, she couldn't contain it. She waited for this time when maybe Jesus took a breath to finish up his sentence. <laughs> Scooted over. Jesus, tell my sister, it's not right what she's doing. 
And instead of Jesus saying, yeah, it's not right, Mary, go back there and help Martha. Jesus, in essence, said, leave her alone. Would you take your hands, rub them together? I want to go into the text now because every one of us have relationships that if we don't know how to deal with it, Man, we can blow up our jobs, we can blow up our homes, we can blow up our church, we can blow up all kinds of relationships because what I've learned is this. You can love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, body, and strength. And you have Bible study every day. Your devotional life is every day. You know the Bible better than the Apostle Paul. But that does not automatically translate to being able to know how to build emotionally healthy relationships case in point Jesus was in the very home of Mary and Martha and they were having relational problems so there are things that we must learn and we oftentimes have come from families where families of origin where we learn just the opposite how to live in toxic relationships how to deal with dysfunctional relationships how to function in the areas of stress we didn't learn the right things I understand I am also in that same boat so I had to learn the principles of how do I deal with building an emotionally healthy relationship may I say this that we must learn to do the work it takes hard work to build an emotionally healthy relationship don't be naive don't be immature don't be foolish or blind in thinking that emotionally healthy relationships, they just magically happen. That's television. That's Hollywood. Guy meets girl, they fall in love, they live happily, happily ever after, and they never have an argument. I've only known one couple like that. Married 50 years, never had an argument. You know where it's, when it started in terms of how they learned to live like that? It was on actually their honeymoon. And on their honeymoon, they decided to go to the Grand Canyon and to ride horseback down the Grand Canyon and just explore it. And so as the wife got close to the base of the Grand Canyon, her horse slipped. The husband that was on his horse right behind her, he heard her whisper. Though it was a whisper, it was audible enough for him to hear. He heard her whisper. That's once. He didn't know what to make of it. As the horse got closer again to the base of the canyon, the horse slipped a second time and he heard his new bride whisper, that's twice. He just shrugged his shoulders. I don't understand. As soon as the horse hit the base of the canyon, it slipped a third time. And the wife said, that's three times. And she pulled out a revolver out of her purse and shot the horse. And the husband said, honey, what did you do? You can't kill a horse. And she said, that's once. <laughs> they have never had an argument in 50 years of marriage. I, I just want you to understand now, when you think about the idea of relationships, we oftentimes, we never had good role models. And we don't even know, what do we aim for in order to be able to achieve an emotionally healthy relationship? When I say do the work, what do you mean do the work? What work? Well, let's give a baseline then. So if I had to describe and give you some of the, the major attributes and signs of an emotionally healthy relationship, I would give you seven of them. So this is what you aim for. Work relation, spouse, children, parents, all that. One, mutual respect. An emotionally healthy relationship must exhibit respect for one another. You display honor and you extend value and courtesy to the other person. There's also genuine care. You actually genuinely care for the other person. You want their best. You care about their well-being. A third sign or attribute of an emotionally healthy relationship is that you practice active listening. I'm not just talking about listening to them on an auditory level. I'm talking about listening on an emotional level. To hear what their wishes and their expectations are and what their emotions are when they express it. Another attribute is that boundaries exist. Each person, you are an independent person from me. I'm an independent person from you. We both have opinions and perspectives and values and thoughts and that should be something that we respect. 
my emotions and your emotions may be different, and I respect yours and you respect mine. Boundaries exist. Any emotionally healthy relationship must be able to recognize this trust. You have to trust one another. And trust means that you're not snooping about, just looking over a person's shoulders, waiting for them to do something bad. Trust is that my wife knows the password to my cell phone. I know the password to her cell phone. So she can look at anything she wants to look. I'm not hiding anything, and nor is she hiding anything. But if I walk in a room and you close the computer and you flip over the phone, then I got problems. I got problems. Another indicator of an emotionally healthy relationship is mutual support. Through encouragement, affirmation, assistance, you want to help the other person grow. You know what the seventh sign or attribute is? It's safe to be honest. When, you're, when your relationship is emotionally safe, now this is a great place to show off your iPhone. Pull out that phone and take a picture. Even if you never look at a picture again, show people that you have an iPhone. I just want you to, you know, just, just to brag. But I, I want you to see that an emotionally healthy relationship is one where it's safe to be honest. Now, over these next several weeks, I'm going to unpack a number of those attributes and signs. Why? Because my prayer is that we'll all learn how to build emotionally safe relationships. I mentioned that you have to do the work. It's hard work. Paul weighs in on the conversation in Colossians 3 and verse 12 by itemizing some of the things that we have to, we have to do that, that he constitutes as work. So verse 12 says of Colossians 3, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. So Paul is telling us that the work of building an emotionally healthy relationship, it includes showing tender-hearted mercy or compassionate mercy. Kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. It takes patience to build an emotionally healthy relationship. The interesting thing is that Paul tells us is that you got to make allowances for each other's faults. The apostle is saying that everyone has a flaw. Everyone is complicated. Everyone has shortcomings. Everyone has areas where you can consider it a fault. Paul says, make allowances for that. You got to do the work. This third grader came home, he's just eight years old, and he, he heard this joke at school, so he decided to use the joke with his dad. He said, Dad, guess what? I want your answer, Dad. He said, to what, son? Tell me, how do you crack an egg to fry it? Or I should say, how do you fry an egg without cracking it? The dad thought, scratched his head. He said, I don't know, son. You stomped me. You got me. And the little boy said, Dad, you got to get someone else to crack it. <laughs> you know, that's what a lot of us do. It takes work to build an emotionally healthy relationship. And many of us want someone else to do the work. It's your relationship. You have to put the work in. And so that's what Jesus was trying to tell Martha. Martha, look, you know, it's, you got to make allowances for the faults of others. Make allowances for the shortcomings. In other words, cut Mary some slack. Don't make a mountain out of a molehill. Don't overreact. In fact, when I go back to the text, looking at it from the message version, Luke 10 verse 41 reads, The master said, Martha, dear Martha, you're fussing far too much and getting yourself worked up over nothing. One thing only is essential, and Mary has chosen it. It's the main course and won't be taken from her. In other words, Jesus is saying, look, 
back away. Part of, part of, I should say, part of relationship building is that you learn that don't, don't, don't blow things out of proportion. Just, just, just back away. Cut her some slack. One of the things I've seen oftentimes in couples where they struggle is that they normally don't respect the humanity of the others, of, the, of their partner. What do I mean by that? If the husband falls short, the wife rakes him over the cold, coals. And the wife, she, she falls short, the husband just rakes her over the coals. Why? Because they don't recognize they're both human beings. Both flawed, both complicated, both prone to mistakes, both prone to having shortcomings. In other words, humanize your spouse. Same way, humanize your children. Humanize your parents. Humanize your colleagues. No one's perfect. No one. And so Jesus was helping Martha to understand, do the work. First is humanize your sister. What we also recognize, if we're going to build emotionally healthy relationships, we must also welcome honesty. In other words, is the relationship safe to be honest? Remember what I mentioned earlier in those seven attributes and signs of an emotionally healthy relationship. One of them is that it has to have safety to be honest. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that the relationship to be, should be so... You know, it should have such latitude and elasticity to it that I don't have to walk around on eggshells. Man, I better not say anything. If I say anything, they're going to flip out. They're going to yell. They're going to say things. They're going to call, name, call me names. You know, all of those kinds of things. No. An emotionally healthy relationship must have space for you to be honest. The Bible is silent as to whether or not Martha spoke to Mary about what Martha considered inconsiderate behavior on Mary's behalf or Mary's person. We don't know. The Bible is silent about it. So we do recognize this. If you have a relationship with someone, be it at work, at school, or in the home, you must then recognize that if silence has to be there, the silence of dishonesty creates bitterness and resentment and hypocrisy in the life of the individual. In other words, if I'm in a relationship with you and I can't say anything to you because you don't welcome honesty, something's going to go on inside of me that's dark and ugly. It's going to either be resentful resentment, bitterness, hypocrisy, feelings of as if there's no latitude for me to be able to share my opinion. All that negative stuff is going to have to go somewhere. And that's why it can be the death nail for relationships when the darkness of silence is there. Now mind you, there's sometimes silence is a reflection of maturity. Sometimes it's that. But if the silence is not a reflection of spiritual maturity or emotional maturity, but rather the silence is a reflection that I don't want to rock the boat, I don't want to say anything, then that silence is a major problem. May I suggest to you that you have to learn how to welcome honesty. Now when I say welcome honesty, I'm saying that people should be their authentic self in your person and you in theirs. If you have a relationship, with that individual and want to see it grow. Now, when you welcome honesty, it doesn't mean that the person can be disrespectful and brutal towards you. That's not what it means. Rather, what it means is that they're able to express their joys, their dreams, their goals, their desires, their wishes. That's the positive side. On the flip side, they're able to to express their frustrations, their pain, their thoughts with you, and you're not going to fall apart when that happens. I remember I was speaking at some conference out west, and during one of the break times, we're all in the, in, at the restaurant around the table, and we're talking about how we critique and evaluate preaching. After the, the lunch, the other speaker comes over to me and says, Hey, when it's my turn to speak, can you give me an assessment and a critique afterwards? So when we got back to the hotel room, my wife was with me. She said, Honey, don't you do it. Don't you do it. Don't do it. 
I'm thankful I heeded her advice because I didn't do it. And the principal reason why I didn't do it is this. I didn't know the other person. I just met him that day. We had not built a rapport, a relationship where what I would say may be misconstrued. And I'm so thankful because when he spoke, I mean, it was a train wreck. It just wasn't. And so the, the only thing I was able to say well, it was to say, man, I, thank you for sharing your heart with us. <laughs> See, you need to have trust so that you can be welcoming of honest feedback. I remember I was speaking at this, it's a new semester for this seminary, and so they had all the professors there, and all the student body was there, and I was invited just to come in and just help, just fire people up for a new semester of grad school. And before I spoke, I was in the dean's office with him, and he learned about some of the ways that we evaluate ourselves as a pastoral team. Because some of the guys had graduated from that seminary. And he, and he said, he said, I heard about what you guys do and how you evaluate each other to coach each other and to strengthen each other and your public speaking gifts. And then he started crying. Tears streamed down his face. He said, in 40 years of preaching, I've never had anybody evaluate me. And I've so longed for that. See, the idea of welcoming honesty is that we don't see ourselves oftentimes. We don't see how we're coming across. We don't hear our tone. We don't hear our, uh, and see our face. We don't see our facial expressions. We don't hear how we're coming across. And so we need to have feedback on the job, in the school, and even in the broader community. And if you don't welcome feedback and welcome honesty, you'll never improve. And you don't recognize that. I used to do some, you know, some consulting in terms of ethics and morality and leadership with the New York Giants. And, and I would go there with, on a Monday, when, with just after the game on Sunday. And it was quiet because they broke the team up into offensive team and defensive team. And they went into different rooms. And they're watching the film of the game before. And they said to me, we always need honest feedback so we can see how we actually performed in the game. These are people that make millions of dollars and they get it. And we oftentimes in relationships that are so critical, you know, parent-child relationship, your relationships with siblings, worker, boss, you know, those who you may be, may, may be your direct reports, even you and your supervisor, and even people, colleagues. We never oftentimes get honest feedback. May I ask you this question? Do you welcome honest feedback? Let me take you to the text. Luke 10, verse 40. But Martha was thinking to herself, I cannot do all this work alone. So she went to Jesus. She said, Master, my sister is not helping me with the work. She has left me to do it alone. You surely do not think that this is right. Tell her that she should help me. The Lord Jesus replied, Martha, Martha. You have troubles in your mind about many things, but only one thing is really important. That is what Mary has chosen to do. Nobody will take it away from her. Let's peel back the conversation. One of the significant signs that I mentioned of a healthy relationship is that it's safe to be honest. I mentioned that the Bible is silent as to whether or not Martha spoke to Mary, but we do know that Martha approached Jesus with something that was very delicate. In other words, Jesus carried himself in such an emotionally safe way that Martha felt that she could speak to him about something that was bothering her that was so personal, family. And Jesus, he was, you know, he was so sensitive that he was able, and he also felt emotional safety, that he was able to provide honest perspective and feedback to Martha, though their opinions differed about the same situation. So he didn't agree with her perspective. He didn't label Mary's behavior as if it were not right, as if it was unethical and immoral, and it was just wrong and it was inconsiderate. He didn't do any of those things. What he was, in, ex in essence, sharing with Martha is that there's another way of looking at this. And it's not black and white, right and wrong. 
Jesus was, in essence, saying that, Martha, you are, I, I, you are so emotionally safe. Let me tell you exactly what I think. Could it be that Mary's hungry for the Word of God? Can't you celebrate that? Martha, you're making too big a deal of Mary's choices. Martha, you're working up something, you're working up something major and it's only minor. Stop blowing it out of proportion. Calm down. Relax. Take it easy. See, do you see the kind of safety? I want you to see if you don't create an emotional safe relationship in every area of your life, particularly in the home, you're going to find yourself that the relationship will be stalled. You want to take it to another level in terms of height, of intimacy and, and health, and it won't go anywhere if it's the ceiling of emotional honesty is not there. It, it's, 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 it caps it. So you have to break through that. I want you to see that part of what it means to build emotionally healthy relationships is that not only do you do the work, but you welcome honesty. And frankly, sometimes honesty hurts. That's why you have to then recognize mix truth with grace. Now, some of us grew up in, in settings where, oh, I told them the truth. I, you know what, oh, come on, I told them just like it is. But that doesn't mean that you didn't create problems. It's the way you communicated the truth. Did you regard the person, his person's feelings? Did you think about where the truth will land? If it doesn't land properly in the heart, it's going to create bitterness and anger and resentment, and you'll find a person shuts down emotionally. And so you got to really mix truth and grace. And may I suggest, sometimes it takes a lot of testing, and it takes trial and error. And don't be afraid to go back and say, did I hurt you when I expressed my opinion? Because I, I didn't want to do that. And then you may have to ask them, can you coach me? How could I have said it in a way where it lands in a way, a healthy way inside of you? And, and so my point to you is that you have to learn those things. And I'm still learning those things after all these years of marriage and ministry. Because you're dealing with different personalities and different seasons of life and all of that. And sometimes I can't be the one that presents the information to that person because... Who I may be to that individual, my words may be weightier to them. So sometimes I ask others, would you go and tell that person these things in your way? Because it's going to land differently to them than if I said it. See, sometimes you got to do that. Now, if you don't have that opportunity, then you say, God, give me wisdom. So I understand how to be strategic when I present my opinion, my perspective. I'm so thankful that Jesus is modeling for us how to have a different opinion from someone and convey it in a way that doesn't create harm. Let me bring this teaching to a close. What we learned, however, is that building emotionally healthy relationships, you have to do the work. You must welcome honesty. And may I say, you must make adjustments. Emotionally healthy relationships, it's, they're constant adjustments you must make. You may say, why make adjustments? You're making room for the other person. You're making room for their personality. You're making room for where they are and their level of maturity or level of immaturity. I'll bring you back to the text again so you can see it. Luke 10 verse 41, using the good news translation. The Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you're worried and troubled over so many things. But just one is needed. Mary has chosen the right thing and it will not be taken away from her. Notice, Jesus challenged Martha to make an adjustment in her perspective of Mary's actions. He's saying, Martha, Mary's actions were not evil. They're, 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 not, they're not malicious. She meant no malicious intent when she decided to come and sit to learn from my teaching. Her actions weren't designed to be nefarious in nature. No. Martha, make the adjustment. You are the one that has the problem, not Mary. 
And the reason why you have a problem is because you're troubled about little things. You have a perfectionistic view of hosting. Man, I just want everything right. I want the food right. I want the, the spices right. I want the, everything set out properly. I want to make sure that they have everything. And you're just making sure everything's right. We've all been in settings where you go to someone's home and the host never sits down to even eat the meal. Why? Because they're just fussing about everything. And they say, have another plate. They haven't had the first yet. Have some more. Have this. And they work themselves to the bone. And then when, it's, when you're leaving, they just sit there collapse. Why? They never enjoyed it. They never enjoyed the occasion. Jesus was giving Martha an alternate perspective to say, Martha, relax. Enjoy the fact that I'm with you. I don't pop in regularly. I don't stop by regularly. Could it be that Mary was, such at, was at such a place mentally in her mental health that she just needed the word? Could it be that her well-being hinged on her hearing this lesson? Could it be that, Martha, you have not learned how to judge Mary by her heart and not by her actions? Make an adjustment, Martha. Stop looking at actions and look at heart. I'm not suggesting that you should never evaluate and deal with someone's actions. What I'm saying is that sometimes our actions, we don't get it right, but our heart is right. And so when our heart's in the right place, but our actions are in the wrong place, we just need to learn how to align the two. But sometimes we're judging people strictly by their actions, and we have not even looked at their heart. Healthy relationships require that you look at the heart and not just look at the actions. When you think about making an adjustment, I had to learn this over the years. I must learn that when I communicate to people to help make adjustments, they may be hurt, but I'm not going to harm them. Hurt and harm are two separate things. It's like, for example, if I have a, a cavity, an infection in one of my gums or in the gum and in the tooth, and it hurts. I got to go to the dentist. And it may hurt a little bit. They're putting Novocaine in there. And, but it hurt. The pain was short term. But he did not or she did not harm me. Hurt is temporal. Harm is long term. And so I want you to think about that. When you communicate whatever you need to communicate, truths, if you don't fill it up with grace and massage it with grace and infuse it with grace, then you may provide harm to someone. If you say things to them that are just raw and brutal and just, and you say, well, it was the truth. But did you create harm? You don't want to harm. And what Jesus was helping Martha understand is the difference between hurt and harm. You may hurt because Mary didn't help you, but Mary didn't harm you. Her actions didn't. Don't harm her trying to use me to confront her publicly in front of my disciples and this way. That's not good, Martha. Make adjustments. I bring you to Matthew 7 verse 12. It says, so then in everything treat others the same way you want them to treat you. For this is the essence of the law and the writings of the prophets. So we're, we're learning that this is how you do it. And so I want all of us to make adjustments this way so we can learn to minister to people and to talk to people, to communicate and build relationships with people, thinking about the way we want to be spoken to. I love what my friend, author and pastor Pete Scazzaro said. Emotional health and spiritual maturity are inseparable. It is not possible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. And I'd want to underscore that. Just because you read the Bible daily and pray daily, don't confuse that with emotional maturity because you're growing in spiritual maturity. If you're really growing in spiritual maturity, you're going to be growing in emotional maturity. Don't confuse Bible knowledge with the lack of the need to grow in emotional maturity. 
treating and talking to people and building relationship with people must be honoring to God. That becomes a great sign also of spiritual maturity. So I wanted to pass along this lesson to you. The first of three as we learn to focus on building emotionally healthy relationships. Amen?